Welcome to another episode of the Pilot Talk podcast by OSM Aviation with my dear friend, Captain Michelle Treskin, and myself, Stein Mjotvet. We are two commercial pilots and flight instructors with a shared passion for aviation and the aviation industry. The Pilot Talk podcast is made with the ambition to inspire, educate, and entertain you, our beloved listeners who either share our passion for flying or simply want to get a peek behind the cockpit door. In this podcast, we will discuss flying, flight training, career advice for pilots, and other interesting topics from the exciting world of aviation. And today's episode, we truly have something exciting, don't we, Michelle? We do. We do. We have a a very special guest, and I tell you, man, it's going to be an eye-opener for everybody. Yeah. He is out on a mission circumnavigating the Earth for the second time. That's right. Already done it around the equator, and this time he's going the other way from pole to pole. Um, he's uh, got a website as well where you can follow him uh, on pole to poleflight.com, and his name is Robert De Laurentiis. The Zen the, uh, Pilot. The Zen Pilot. He is now writing his second book. He already wrote one, which you mentioned there, Michelle, The Zen Pilot. And um, he's working on the second one. So really interesting uh, story, really interesting mission. Yeah, He's doing this, yeah. And he's doing this to inspire uh, people to get into aviation, to to, um, get into the STEM STEM uh, subjects or areas, uh, I should say, so science, technology, engineering, math, um, and obviously he, he's also on a scientific mission. Exactly. Um, supporting science along the way. So we're really excited to talk to Robert, aren't we? Oh, man, I, I can't wait. Uh, yeah. he's got, I'm, I'm sure he's got, a, he's got a bag full of stuff that, uh, of knowledge and uh, exciting stories, I, which I can't wait to, uh, to listen and I think his second book, I just thought about it, it's Flying Through Life, I think it's called, if yeah, I remember correctly. Nice. Anyways, Robert will tell us that uh, when we start the interview. But uh, yeah, something incredible. Incredible guy, and he's flying an incredible airplane. So you guys stay tuned, and we're gonna, you're going to love this episode. Yep. You are listening to Pilot Talk by OSM Aviation. <laughs> It's uh, it's a pleasure to um, to have you with us, Robert. Um, I we've uh, we've briefly emailed back and forth um, and uh, talked a little bit about the exciting uh, project and journey that you are on right now. But uh, I would love it if you could um, could tell us a little bit about who you are and uh, what you are up to these days. All right. Well, about five years ago, I um, decided I would spend my time writing, lecturing, and giving back with respect to aviation. I had a pretty good run in the real estate uh, business as a landlord, and I was thankful for you know everything that had come into my life. So I wrote a book uh, called Flying Through Life, and it was about the 19 spiritual concepts I had used in my business that allowed me to purchase an aircraft, which was the Spirit of San Diego, And that was my first plane I took on a equatorial circumnavigation uh, around the planet back in 2015. And what I wanted to do is show other aspiring pilots uh, how they could create those resources of time and money in their lives so that they could do the same thing. And I thought it would be a pretty dramatic way uh, to show them by flying around the world and, you know, sharing some of my experiences. In the process of that, I had a engine failure 14,000 feet over the Strait of Malacca and uh, dead sticked about 19.6 nautical miles into Kuala Lumpur International with, you know, uh, oil spraying on the um, 1,500 degree windshield. exhaust. No, not on the windshield, oh, luckily. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had a, got a break, I guess. <laughs> and, um, you know, landed in International Airport. And that's where my second book, which was called Zen Pilot, Flight of Passion and the Journey... The journey within actually began so yeah things have uh, sort of followed a natural course here i guess you could say and once i finished that equatorial circumnavigation and lectured for a couple of years uh finished zen pilot the book and got it out into the world we wanted to come back and do something even bigger and the premise of the first book was pursuing the impossibly big dream so one step bigger than an equatorial circumnavigation was a polar 
circumnavigation. At least that's what we thought. Um, what I later came out to, or figured out was that it was about three times harder and it took us three yeah. times as long to prepare for that South Pole leg. But, um, you know, we've completed that and here I am in Stockholm just sort of trying to figure out how I'm going to get over the North Pole and I think I have my plan now. Yeah, because you got to go to the North Pole over it and you can't just continue to Siberia. <laughs> well, actually, my route is going to be um, from Svalbard, which is about the, the furthest north you can get in Norway, and then to the North Pole, the true North Pole, the magnetic North Pole, and the North Pole of inaccessibility, and then into Prudhoe Bay or Dead Horse in Alaska. Mm -hmm. And if my calculations are correct, that's pretty close to 2000 nautical, which is about half the distance as that South Pole leg was. Wow. So. I, I hesitate to say it should be easier because sometimes the universe doesn't <laughs> allow that, but it's it's look it's looking good. I'll say that. Yeah. How exciting. Yeah. And you yeah, started that. and you started flying like in the, your later years, right? Yeah, 45 ish is when I uh, finally started to fly. And it wasn't because I didn't have a desire earlier in my life. It's I just didn't have the time and money. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, aviation is pretty tough in that way. Yeah, yeah, but it's good. It's good to see because it's good to hear as well. Because there's a lot of expiring pilots that I want to change career and start a new career uh, as a pilot. They and they also are hesitant because they're saying, "Well, maybe I'm too old, and you know, who's going to hire an older guy?" Sort of thing. Right. You know? And you're you're a good example that uh, you know you've set your mind up and you went for it. Yeah, you know, I've never been a commercial pilot. I got my license, but I've never been paid to fly. So I don't know if I would be hired, but uh, I'm certainly having a good time right now. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'd hire you. Oh, would you? After okay. reading what you've done, I think I'd hire you, for sure. What do I get, what do I get to fly? Can it be better <laughs> than what I'm in? Oh, I, I love the airplane that you're flying now. You're flying a, in a Rockwell Commander, right? Uh, it's Rockwell actually... Commander the Gulfstream version oh. of the Turbine Commander, and it's the 900, not the 1000, oh which is the faster, in my opinion, the better plane for, you know, this flight. Five blade props. Yeah. Yeah, that was the first uh, Turbine Commander that the uh, MT ever put their five bladed prop on. So I'm really honored, you know, to be sponsored by them since 2015. And it was funny because the first flight uh, people were warning me because I was told Hartzell had tried to do the five bladed prop and the plane had crashed and the pilot had died. Oh. So everybody was saying it wouldn't be better. It wouldn't work. And we showed him wrong. Now the, the MT is backed up by six months for demand for that propeller. Wow. Wow. So, and, and you're still using Allison engines, right? Um, well, Garrett, which was bought out by Honeywell, right. And, uh, it's the TPE 331 10T. Okay. So yeah, the carrots. Yeah. And yeah. those are the same ones that are on the predator drones. So, mm. um, you know, originally those were 750 horsepower, but we're getting 1147 out of each one of them. Wow. So super fast. Wow. Cool. That's pretty, yeah. that's pretty cool. cool. You I'm have all a excited pretty, that talk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you have a pretty well equipped airplane in general. I saw that you had uh, you have synthetic vision on it and, and lots of newer technology. Is that correct? Right. We basically tried to upgrade it with everything that was available today. So uh, mm -hmm. the last thing I did to it before I left was installed uh, ADSB in and out. And then we have a, a special transponder, um, you know, one on the top, one on the bottom of the plane so that uh you know we can optimize that signal and um but yeah we have synthetic vision touch screen with backup knobs of course we have satellite music satellite weather satellite um what am i leaving out here communications <laughs> right um and you know we have some old school stuff too we have a dg a directional gyro that was really helpful crossing the south pole Hmm. Um, we also have the uh, ES500 as a backup attitude indicator that's battery powered. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Uh, we have ADF because that's required in Europe. And yeah. uh, we had to keep that in. A lot of people are taking that out. Uh, I've got a radar, a digital three dimensional autopilot. Uh, it's the S Tech 2100 because the 3100 hasn't been approved yet for that plane. Wow. Um, and then I decided to go with Avidyne, which um, was a, a big change because I had a fully equipped Garmin panel 
Right. And then decided to shift over to a flight management system. Mm. Wow. Do you have a, an espresso coffee machine? You know, <laughs> I, <laughs> I'd like to in a little orange crush dispenser, <laughs> right? That's right. How cool is that? <laughs> well, you saw the, it's, it's incredible. Uh, and do you do you fly by yourself uh, to do that uh, for you doing your, your mission? Are you doing it by yourself or you have someone with you? No, it's by myself for the most part. I did have a mentor of mine, a uh, lady named Susan, Gil uh, her name is Susan Gilbert, and she was the person who got me into flying. And she's okay. playing a very big part in terms of social media, publishing my books on this trip. And she helped uh, with the planning of the flight as well. She was with me for about a month, but that's been about it. Now, okay. originally when the flight was supposed to start in 2018, I had spoken with Eric Lindbergh and I'm hoping that he'll still fly a leg with me when I get back to the United States and Mark Armstrong as well. Wow. Yeah. What, what an honor that would be. Yeah, that, that'll be cool. I, I hope it yeah, still works excellent. in term of terms of timing. Well, we hope so. We hope so. Wow, cool. Yeah. What's uh, So you mentioned, um, Robert, that, that it was three times more difficult to do this circumnavigation than the last one. What was the, What would you say increased the difficulty the most? What kind of surprised you along the way? Because this is your second one. And, you know, what were your expectations versus what actually uh, happened along the way. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, originally back in 2015, it took about six months to prepare for that equatorial circumnavigation. And I assume that because I had more experience this time, uh, probably a more capable uh, support team as well, and some more uh, sponsorship that it would go relatively easily. Um, I was humbled three times because, um, it is so much more difficult to take a plane, you know, almost double its range out to 4,200 nautical miles from 2000. But uh, one of the biggest things was fuel gelling. So mm. at the South Pole, we were expecting uh, temperatures as low as minus 60 Celsius, and the engines were rated to minus 53. And Jet A1, which you can get down in South America, is good to minus 47. So what we had to do is come up with a system where we could heat the fuel and then we needed to find a way to get it into the engines without having it go outside of the plane. And the original plan was to go out a window, you know, out into the air outside and then in a, into a drain line. But we were able to find that if we drilled a hole in the pressurized chamber, we could route the fuel out the back and then between the pressurized chamber and the skin of the ship into the wing route where the air over the uh, wing root would heat it a little bit with friction, and then it would go to a fuel pump, which would heat it a few, few more degrees, and then a heat exchanger, and then we were home free. And we determined that that time of the year, fuel would probably come from a Bowser, and it would be right around freezing. So it could drop uh, 47 degrees Celsius, and we'd still be fine. But it never really got exposed um, aside from, you know, inside the hull of the ship. So that was, that was fine. And then on the outside of the plane with the engines, the Honeywells, I had talked to somebody who had flown in minus 60 and he said they were fine. I mean, they obviously create so much heat that, uh, that actually wasn't, um, one of the huge concerns. The other thing was navigation because at the South pole, everywhere is North from there and GPS units typically get pretty confused. So that's why we had the directional gyro installed. Uh, I took a line of position on the sun. And then I talked to um, some British pilots who had flown down uh, in Antarctica. And they said that you can cheat a Garmin GPS by putting a waypoint before the pole and after the pole. Now I went to Avidyne and they said that they had simulated flights over the South Pole and everything was fine. So that was actually one of the reasons why I installed that system into the plane. Now, when I got down to the South Pole, you know, all hell broke loose. Everything went blank. It started failing, you know, 15 minutes before. <laughs> so so oh my God. the funny thing was that the um, my iPad seemed to be pretty solid. And, you know, you have to shift from magnetic to true when you get down there by the South Pole, um, which I did. And the directional gyro worked well. I had a line of position on the sun. And I actually did two circles around the South Pole, one for the planet and one for the people. And as you can imagine, you're probably burning more than half your fuel on the way down because you're heavy. 
So it's yeah. really a game of nerves, you know, how far are you going to go before you turn back? And at that point I decided it was time to, you know, head back and get home as soon as I could. So you took off from which point down south to uh, La, the Terra del Fuego or something like that, I guess? And yeah, Ushuaia, Argentina. And yeah. originally I was trying to leave from Punta Arenas, but that C-130 uh, went down into the Drake Passage about a week before and they were running rescue ops from there. And oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, they lost, I think it was 36 or 37 souls uh, uh -huh. just a week before I left, which really spooked me because, you know, they had two pilots. I was one. They had four engines. I had two. They had experience. I had none. Their flight was two hours. Mine <laughs> was 18. <laughs> so uh, that didn't really help the stress level before the trip. But uh, So it was an 18-hour journey. Yeah, 18 hours. Long time. Wow. Oh, and by yourself. Yeah, definitely by myself. I had a few people that were interested in going with me, but, you know, I prepared for 18 months for this thing. And I thought, you know what? Um, fuel is worth more to me than a co-pilot is. And, you know, maybe this is going to be something that's just for me. And sometimes I think when you get into remote parts of the planet, it's really an opportunity for growth on a different level. You can't necessarily, necessarily experience, you know, uh, in a busy city or, you know, somewhere you're yeah. accustomed to. So which, which altitude were you at when you did the, uh, your 18 hours? Um, it varied a little bit. I was anywhere from about 28, uh, up to 32. We upgraded the, pr the plane with RVSM and those engines were more than capable of getting, getting me up there. All right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Cool. Wow. God, God was your co-pilot on that day. <laughs> you know, um, it was really <laughs> funny because, um, you know, there were challenges that were happening right up to departure. We didn't really get our insurance until a couple of weeks before. Uh, the Chilean um, scientific community told me that I could not go to Antarctica, that I needed their approval. And I got that word about um, a week before I left the U.S. And that's when we shifted from uh, Punta Arenas to Ushuaia and also to the Falklands because we weren't having luck uh, at uh, uh, Punta Arenas. So then we had two backup plans. And in the end, we would have had permission to leave from all three, with the exception of Punta Arenas because of the rescue ops. Right, right. So, right. wow. Yeah, it, it, was a, it was a handful. Yeah. Thank God. Lots of Incredible. preparation going into that. I can, you know, and I, it's a, uh, it sounds like a good mix of trying to get approvals, trying to make sure that the airplane is built in the right way for the fuel considerations and the temperature, yeah. like so many things to think about. Uh, but one of the things that you know, I don't necessarily think that most people consider is what you just said, Robert, that you know it really gives time for reflection, for afterthought, and that journey, making that trip by yourself. Wow, that must have been a mental journey as well for you Personally, I think we just want to say something else about that. Yeah, you know, it was funny because when it was actually completed, um, I almost, I, it was hard for me to believe, you know, because I had prepared for it for 18 months. I got on the ground. Um, I thought I was going to be arrested by the police because I had returned to Ushuaia um, 18 hours later, and you're supposed to wait longer than that before you can go back to that airport. Um, you know, I came in, I was not able to uh, contact the air traffic controller. I had to descend below the clouds and come in VFR. Um, and I would wake up and it was like, wow, did I really do that? I, I almost didn't believe it myself. And I thought, you know, maybe I'm going to wake up one of these days and, you know, I'm, it was a dream or I'm in some sort of insane asylum strapped to a bed <laughs> and, you know, I was a pilot, so I... <laughs> If I was going to go crazy, I'd do it the right way. But um, yeah, and it wasn't, you know, until about a month later that I really started believing it. It sounds kind of funny, but I think it was too much packed into such a short mm. period of time. Um, but yeah, fantastic. I'd never do it again, but I, I'm really happy yeah. it went as well as it did. It's funny because you sound exactly like uh, the first astronaut that went to the moon. <laughs> It's exactly the same. They, only, they had the same feelings. They had the same way that, of looking at it and reflecting. And, and you sound exactly that, like you went to the moon and you came back. You know, it's, it's incredible. It's an incredible journey. Wow. Well, you know, I didn't know the plane could do it 
until I actually took off on that day for the South Pole because we had tested the plane at about 80% ferry fuel and you would never load it up completely and stress out the wing spar if you could avoid right, it. Right. So there was a brilliant guy who used to work for Scaled Composites. His name is Robert Morgan and he did a lot of the um, projects there including Voyager. So I gave him my uh, calculations from that test flight and then he did a projection and told me that I had the range to make it. And, you know, I had planned to uh, depart Ushuaia in a certain direction. And on that day, the winds had reversed. So I was going to have to take off. And right in front of me, there was a mountain. So I had to make a 180 degree turn in the channel and head back the other way with full fuel. And I quite honestly didn't know, you know, what was going to happen. And, you know, the plane uh, during the test flights took off at about 4,000 feet of runway. And I had about 9,200 at Ushuaia, sea level, cold day. Uh, and I took off about halfway down the runway. And then I climbed at 1,800 feet per minute, which I was really impressed with. You know, I could usually get about 3,000 feet per minute out of it if it was light. But I didn't expect 1,800 feet per minute. I was thinking maybe, you know, 300. Cessna 172. Four, <laughs> or 152, right? <laughs> <laughs> Wow. wow. So the plane, the plane was impressive. I was really pleased with it. Yeah, yeah. Well, no balls, no glory, right? I guess not. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, um, it's funny because Fred Sorensen, I don't know if you guys know him. He's kind of a, a legend in the ferry community. He's been tanking planes for 40 years. And he said, um, God, he had a great quote, uh, something about... Um, brass balls and when your 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 balls are hard enough you know it's then it's it's time for the flight um he, he's gonna be pissed that i just misquoted him but, yeah, you, yeah, but you get the yeah. idea yeah, you'll call you on that one yeah. oh brilliant wow yeah, yeah. Then, but you know we had uh, guys like like you guys uh airline pilot a guy named mike jesh who works for united and mike was uh, instrumental in helping me prepare for the flight you know, we talked a lot about navigation. We talked about uh, the flight characteristics of the plane, you know, the temperatures it could operate. And when I was applying for insurance, uh, nobody wanted to insure this trip, as you can imagine. And I remember I, I was in um, uh, Las Vegas for NBAA and I got to meet with the underwriter and we were talking and I could see he was kind of on the fence. And I mentioned that I had spoken with Mike and Mike said, you know, I think you've identified all the risks and I think you're going to be fine. And I could just see this guy, you know, sort of take a, a deep breath because he knew that I had been consulting with some really smart, capable, experienced pilots. And we had done a, a good job, good job preparing. Yeah. And you, you say something very interesting there. I mean, flying is, it, it, we've said it before, it's, there's always risk associated to it. We're not supposed to be up there. It's not our natural habitat, but... You know, there are going to be risks, and like you said, it, we just need to identify them and mitigate them yeah. in the best way possible through preparation, through training, through knowledge, whatever it is. Um, and I, I think, you know, on a mission like this, it's just it's so completely from start to finish ops not normal. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, one of the things that really surprised me is. You know, when I had selected the Turbine Commander 900, um, you know, we started talking about the things we could do to modify this aircraft. It was uh, 1983, and, you know, when I started replacing, like, engines, propellers, environmental system, avionics, um, I was expecting that we put it in and everything was just going to work. But the old saying that 10% of new parts fail, just like 10% of or what is it, in the first 10% of the life of a part and the last 10% is when it'll fail. And that's exactly what happened. Really? All these new systems had stressed the plane out because it wasn't used to flying at flight level 350. It wasn't used to flying that fast, that far, and almost everything failed us. So I was you know, dealing with these issues right up until departure and I was starting to lose faith that maybe you know this isn't gonna work. And um, miraculously, it just stopped when the trip started. And then everything was working very, very reliably. Wow. Um, you know, we had a uh, windshield crack at 30,000 feet. Um, the fuel controllers that had not been rebuilt, 
um, failed at 34,500, so we had to have those redone. The environmental system failed after six hours, so that was again rebuilt. But miraculously, you know, things sort of started working when I started putting hours on the plane. Wow. Uh, just as I departed, so yeah. very lucky in that regard. So, so you got the plane ready and all that, but what about your body, the mind, yourself? Because you, you, have, to, you have to be there sitting down for 18 hours all by yourself. So did you do any conditioning or did you have a special diet to get yourself ready for that trip? Yeah, that's a good, <clears throat> good question. Um, it was physical, but it was also mental preparation as well. And, you know, physically I was uh, walking, I was lifting weights, I was stretching, I was uh, changing my diet. I lost about five or 10 pounds uh, before the, the trip started. Mentally, quite honestly, I was just scared. And I, um, I talked to a guy who had done a similar trip in a Lance Air that was very heavily modified. He was flying slower. Uh, his routing was somewhat similar. And I asked him, I said, hey, how did you stay up for 24 hours? And he said to me, he goes, you know, Robert, I was afraid the entire time. Adrenaline. And yeah, yeah. So I was sort of prepared for that. Um, and I was scared, you know, the entire trip. Uh, it was one of those things where, you know, you're in the plane, it's working and you're just waiting, you know, for something to go wrong. <laughs> and uh, thank God it didn't. Thank God it didn't. I was very lucky. I assessed my chances of um, actually physically surviving that flight at about 50%. And what that meant was I packed up all my personal belongings. I put them in the corner of my hotel room. I left the hotel manager with my family's address. And, you know, it was like a toss of the coin. And when you add together, you know, the new systems, the temperature, the distance, um, you know, pilot fatigue, uh, just all those things together, the history, you know, of modifying the plane, my lack of experience, the weather, um, I think 50% was a pretty reasonable number. Yeah, yeah. So. And you still went. Yeah, I still went. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't do that in Vegas. <laughs> no, no. Um, I would never do that again, quite honestly. <laughs> Did you take off, uh, you took off at night, I guess, to be mostly in the daytime to, uh, to be over the pole? Well, you know, that's another great question because just a few days before I was, uh, you know, running through the different scenarios in my mind and I realized that if I took off when I wanted to, which was about 9 a.m., I would um, land at night when the airport was closed. Mm -hmm. So I had to delay my departure until 2 p.m. to actually arrive back. Um, about 30 minutes after the airport opened. And that would have me departing during the daylight and returning in the daylight. The problem was though, I was already up, you know, since 6 a.m. and I didn't depart until uh, two. And there's another ferry pilot saying, I'll get this one right, which is you don't start the ferry flight until you're exhausted. And I was <laughs> physically and mentally exhausted, you know, when I departed. <laughs> That's how cargo pilots are. Is it? Yeah. 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 You're always, not, you're always tired when you leave. <laughs> yeah. I, um, yeah, just another stressor. You know, there was a lot of them. A lot of them. Yeah. Wow. So. Good for you. Pilot Talk with Stein Mjotvit and Michelle Treskin. It's a, it's a, it's a really exciting uh, mission, I, I got to say. And uh, I can't, you know, just hearing about it is exciting. I can't imagine how it felt when you were about to depart and along the way, you know, like, but what, when it comes to the, the flight itself, um, you know, you said you were lucky, you had a few issues with the plane, but you, know, you replaced a few parts, and, but everything went more or less smoothly in terms of the actual plane itself. Were there any specific, you know, mental hurdles along the way after you started the journey or any other unforeseen issues that you were like, oh, I wasn't expecting that I'd have to deal with this? Yeah, one of the things that was um, happening probably two weeks before I got there was my right fuel gauge would fail. And I, w I wasn't able to determine, you know, when it would happen. It was kind of random. And the actual uh, unit that controlled that was behind the five ferry tanks that I had inside the passenger compartment of the plane. So there was no way to get to it. And I had tried, you know, reversing the gauges. I checked the 
wires. I was going through all kinds of options. And finally, what I came up with is that I would fill my pilot side tank and then cross connect and leave that cross connect valve open for a period of time. So technically I would not know exactly how much fuel I had in that wing but I would start off with 2000 nautical miles of range, which would almost get me to the pole. And then by the time I'd be flying back, even if I lost one engine, because, you know, I didn't know exactly how much fuel was in there. I knew the turbine commander could fly on one engine with pretty close to full fuel. Um, I had that happen when we put the new engines or the refurbished engines back on one of them wouldn't unfeather. So I had to land, you know, on one engine and it's just a trim adjustment. I mean, it's so much horsepower. The yeah. plane, I, I hesitate to say it, but it's almost like the plane doesn't care, you know, cause I've got <laughs> 1150 horsepower to one side. That's like a Pilatus PC-12 just on one side. On one side, yeah. <laughs> so That's incredible. Yeah, it's, it's a tough plane. Um, so that was a concern. I had a minor fuel leak in the plane. I was able to tighten that up with a wrench. Um, like I said, my flight management systems kept falling offline as I got close to the pole. Um, trying to think what else happened. Um, I think that's pretty much it. Yeah. Yeah. Any, yeah. any power napping? I tried that. And, you know, the guys that did um, that nonstop flight around the world in the, what was it called? Uh, Bertrand Bricard. Yeah. yeah. Uh, solar that's, impulse. That's it. He, yeah. he, he had done uh, micro naps. So I thought, well, I'll set my iPhone, you know, to 15 minutes and give it a try. And the, the second time I tried it, I woke up and the left engine was running kind of rough and it really scared me. And I thought, okay, no more naps. <laughs> you know, I had no idea why that happened. Um, it seemed to go away. I wasn't sure if it was in my head. And by that time I was to the Drake passage. And that was the last two hours where, you know, that plane had gone down before. So I thought, uh, maybe I shouldn't be napping over the Drake passage. <laughs> yeah. Right on. Yeah, right on. It, it's a pretty interesting aircraft you've been traveling with. I mean, it was it was released in 81, I think, the, the aircraft itself. And then you've done all these modifications to it. You have long range tanks for the mission. You've upgraded it with a lot of avionics. And that's gives you a lot of tools to work with, obviously. It gives you a better situational awareness, but also, you know, all these modifications on an older plane, uh, there's some excitement in that. <laughs> you know? Yeah, you know, I'm. there's a huge list of all the things we did, um, you know, things like ceramic coating on the outside of the plane to maybe gain an extra knot or two. Mm. There was a little step that as you'd open the door, it would sort of come out so you could step on that. And that was a source of uh, pressurization leaks and it was a little rickety, so we basically sealed it inside the plane. Um, you know, so many, so many things to make it do that. And then plus we added a couple scientific experiments to the plane because we didn't want it just to be about the flying. We wanted it to involve right. science, you know, and improve the planet. So in addition to using biofuels for the first time over the South and North Pole, uh, I had a, a NASA experiment and then one from the Scripps Institute of Oceanography that we used to detect plastic particles in the atmosphere. And most recently out of Spain, where I was for uh, three months, we were testing to see if there was coronavirus in the atmosphere. So we, that was what? one of the ways we got out of Spain because, you know, I had a legitimate reason for, for hey, leaving I'm, there. I'm in Spain right now, don't say that to me. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize that. Where in Spain are you? I'm in Malaga. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I was in Sitges for a while. Okay. Um, beautiful and, and, place. And when did you find out with the coronavirus and the atmosphere in Spain? Is, is there any or should I well, be uh, alarmed? <laughs> you know, I've taken the samples and we'll send those back to the lab. Um, so we don't have the answer to that okay. yet. Right. It's a pretty, that, that experiment is pretty basic. It's, it's just sticky tape on the uh, leading edge of uh, two wings and then also on the nose. So I very carefully remove that, uh, put it in some wax paper and then seal it Sent in plastic. Yeah, cool. so we'll see. That's also helping us as well to get permission mm. to leave out of Norway mm. because to go to Svalbard, you have to have a legitimate scientific reason. Mm. And in addition to our two experiments, I also have a cinematographer 
that's going to be coming out from the United States that's been helping to film the docuseries. So those two things are, are key, I think, in getting us permission. And we don't have permission yet, but I, I'm somewhat confident that we'll get that soon. Yeah, well, best so. of luck with hopefully. that. I really hope you do. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, one of the, the uh, you know, the other challenge uh, after the flight was uh, when I landed in Dakar, uh, we were fueling the number one ferry tank, which fed number two through six. And there was this one phase of a earlier flight where I misaligned one of the 20 valves. And <laughs> instead of, you know, the air coming in through the vent and pushing the fuel out, the vent was closed. So you had all that cabin pressure, 6.7 PSI, crushing the tank, imploding it. And so when we were filling the tank in the car, it burst. And one uh, third of the way down or two thirds of the way up, the seam cracked and it spilled, I would imagine it was 140 gallon tank. So probably close to a hundred gallons of Jet A um, oh, inside the cabin of the plane. Wow. Oh my God. So, so what did you do? Yeah, I panicked, uh, quite honestly. It was spraying into my eyes, on my chest, my arms, my stomach, my groin, my legs. And um, what I did is I tried to deflect it out of the cabin. So I was able to grab a plastic bag. Um, there was a drain line at the bottom that I uh, cut and then put it outside the plane. And uh, it drained all over the tarmac. And I mean, I don't know, a couple hundred feet in every direction was all jet A. Wow. And I was pouring water on my eyes, um, basically took my clothes off, put them in a pile, grabbed some new stuff, and just watched the fuel drain out the bottom of the plane. And the fire department came and they took their fire hoses and just with water dispersed it. And by the time, you know, most of it had drained into the plane, the guy that was my handler said, hey, uh, I gotta go. <laughs> and I, I I was like, you know, what do I do? I can't leave the plane open in Dakar, no. right? Because stuff would walk away. So I closed the cabin and we went to the hotel and the fuel was, you know, coming out of a drain hole. And by the time I got there the next day, I thought this is gonna be the world's biggest mess, right? Because a hundred gallons of jet fuel all over the tarmac okay. and it was gone, it evaporated. It must have been the temperature because I thought it would still, you know, because it's kerosene. It's kind of it's like oily, oily. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh. But it, it continued to drip out of the plane for the next two to three weeks. So I would land somewhere and, you know, there was two spots where it was draining and it's coming out. So and it smells horrible. Mm -hmm. as you, you, can't, might imagine. you can't say it's your air conditioning. No. <laughs> In fact, people, you know, the joke was, you know, I get into a taxi and, you know, the guy would be looking at me and I'd say, oh, it's um, jeté, which is cologne for aviators. And he'd say, do you mind if I roll my window down? I'm like, it's okay. Oh, that's funny. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah. Good story. Yeah. Wow. Unfortunately, you know, it's, it's not great on your sinuses or your eyes. So during these longer flights, you know, I, I get out and it's agitated, but I haven't been able to find any long-term medical mm. issues for the number of hours that I, you know, I have remaining. So I'm just dealing with it for now. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, what's your time frame that you have now until you finish your uh, your objective, like uh, doing that? So you got a couple of months ago or what? Um, that's a good question. What we have planned for right now is mid-June, I'll fly to Iceland, meet the camera crew, we'll film for about a week, and then I'll go to Norway, to Svalbard, and depart sometime in July. Uh, temperatures are optimum at the North Pole during the month of July, so the plan is to leave from there, pass over the three poles that I mentioned, and then into Prudhoe Bay sometime in July. Okay. Uh, anywhere from the 1st probably through the 15th, and then you know, through Alaska, Canada, back in the United States, um, Washington, and then to San Diego. And, you know, in some ways, I consider this my victory lap. And I know that sounds kind of silly. But, you know, after the South Pole, you know, everything was was easier in comparison. It's all gravy. It's all gravy. Yeah. 
And I'm, you know, I'm hesitant to get too cocky about that because we know every time you step into a plane, the past doesn't matter. You're dealing with, you know, what's happening in that moment. But, uh, you know, we bring experience forward. And um, like I said, the plane is working relatively well right now. So I'm just uh, praying for an easy or a reasonable finish to this trip. Mm -hmm. Right. And what do you, um, what do you, what are you going to do when you're finished? What, uh, any plans or you're just going to lay low and enjoy and suck it in? Well, my dad's been uh, asking me to get a country club membership and, you know, stop <laughs> doing <laughs> <laughs> stop doing these trips. Um, I'll, I'll finish the, uh, the book, uh, which is uh, Peace Pilot to the Ends of the Earth and Beyond. Uh, we'll finish the docuseries. And then I'm committed to uh, lecturing for AOPA because we have their 80th anniversary decal and it was my commitment to them to make it to the South Pole in 2019, which I did. Uh, and then I'll do, um, you know, Oshkosh, Sun and Fun. Uh, I, I have uh, some interest from the Smithsonian to do a lecture there, which has been one of my dreams. Cool. And then there's different museums. Uh, Redbird Flight Simulators is one of my sponsors. So I'm working on five flight simulations. So anybody who steps into a Redbird simulator will get to fly to the South Pole if they, you know, so desire. Oh, cool. Um, and, you know, the, the idea is to absolutely scare the daylights out of anybody who sits <laughs> in that seat. <laughs> uh, the, the joke was actually that, you know, each simulator would come with a psychologist to, like, nurse them through <laughs> the emotional <laughs> trauma. <laughs> It'll be like a carnival ride. Yeah. So oh, um, I, I think based on some of the stuff that's happened, we can give them a good ride for their money. But um, yeah, probably for two years. And then, um, you know, my desire is to slow down a bit after that. But sometimes the opportunities come in after, you know, the trip. Yeah. So we'll wait and see. Certainly electric planes are uh, the focus of an awful lot of energy right now. So Um, I don't know. I'd, I'd love it if somebody came up to me and asked me to do some high-profile flights to fun places. Hmm. Um, like I said, I'm not interested in going back to the South Pole, except maybe <laughs> on a on another yeah. airplane or something. But um, yeah. for for now, yeah, I'm going to just yeah. take it day by day and finish my commitments that I have right now. Beautiful. Beautiful. I can't wait to read the book, actually. Yeah, you know, I've seen episode uh, five of the docuseries. So we have all five and we have three more to go and they're getting progressively better. So I'm really excited to see what we can do with that. I think it'll be great for aviation. It'll get people excited. And, you know, when I um, first decided to do this trip, I, I wasn't 100 percent sure that we could pull it off, quite honestly. Mm -hmm. And um uh, You know, a lot of people work very hard. A lot of amazing sponsors have contributed, uh, not just their products, but their expertise as well. So I, I think we've pulled off something really big with this. And um, I'm hoping that it inspires a lot of new pilots to come in and make yeah. aviation a career, you know, so they have a good, good flying experience from the very beginning. Yeah, well, we're honored to have you. I tell you right now, it's a big, 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 big thing for us. It's huge. Well, it's fun to be on your show. I, I'm excited about the number of people that will hear about oh, the trip and hopefully yeah. inspire some of them to go after some impossibly big dreams. Yeah, yeah. there well, you go. An honor. Yeah, and it was it was pretty interesting, uh, Robert, because I passed one of my colleagues today when I was uh, going for lunch, and he flies the Turbine Commander too. Uh, oh, really? And I mentioned that we we're going to have you on the show, and he already knew about you because he's, you know, there's a couple of groups online that he's a member of, and he's he'd already heard about your mission. So he was he got really stoked about the fact that we were going to talk to you today, and and um, I think it's a it's a good note as well here towards uh, the end when wrapping up the conversation. Where should people go to learn even more about your mission and and your trip? Yeah. You have a website, uh, is that right? Yes, it's www.poletopoleflight.com. So P-O-L-E-T-O-P-O-L-E -E -E flight.com. And when you first get to that site, we have our teaser video. And that's the 24 hours before departure to the South Pole. I think the video is about five minutes long. But if you really want to uh, have an experience in a short period of time, that's a cool video to watch. It is. Uh, it is. Oh, have you seen it? Oh, yeah, yeah that's what I saw. It's perfect. <laughs> Brilliant. I I actually get choked up when I watch it because it takes me back, you know, to that moment, <laughs> and I'm like, 
shaking my head like what was i thinking <laughs> you get you get the shakes yeah, yeah it's pretty scary <laughs> right. well i tell you uh, you're definitely going to be inspiring a lot of people and uh, again it's i'm 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 stoked i'm i'm honored and i'm humbled and i wish you only the very best and i can't wait to to see you again and talk to you again and it's just an it's, i love it Really? Yeah, you know, the, the plane is a very impressive thing, too, and I hope that you guys get a chance to see it at some point because you just take one look at that thing and you know it's 100% serious. We, we yeah. weren't messing around at all. Yeah. It looks awesome. Are, it is awesome. Do you have it parked at Orlando now, Robert? <laughs> um, right now it's in Malmo. Oh, it's in Malmo. Gotcha. Right. And uh, if all goes well, we replace um, one of the ferry tanks that uh, was just reworked. Uh, later this week, and then I'll do a test flight up to northern Sweden, maybe back to Malmo or directly over to Iceland from there. Mm. But um, it's at a wonderful FBO called MTS Aviation, and they've been very kind and supportive of general aviation, which is a good thing to see in Europe. Yeah. yeah. If, yeah. Uh, if, and I don't, I know this is a lot to ask, but if uh, opportunity to do so arises, we're at Vesteros Airport just west of uh, Stockholm. Uh, oh. So if you find yourself doing a detour, that's where uh, one of our flight schools is, and that's where I am. So it would be, uh, be lovely if you could stop by. I know that uh, definitely our students would be stoked to see your aircraft. Um, but, you know, oh, yeah. I know yeah. that you have a lot of things to do on this final stretch of your mission, but I just want to throw it out there and uh, let, me, let us know if you want to stop by. I'd be more than welcome. Okay. And if you need to divert to Malaga, oh, well, I'm in Malaga, <laughs> and I would love to see your airplane and, and meet you as well. <laughs> you know, my uh, three months in Spain was actually very, very nice. Um, I had planned to travel around a little bit in Europe during the time it takes for the North Pole to warm up. So, you know, what a blessing to be in a place like Europe during this. Uh, Sweden, you know, is I'm actually in Stockholm right now. So, nice uh, yeah, wonderful, beautiful people, you know, oh, very yeah. kind. Oh, yeah. Uh, the city is, I think, it's a, as close to a utopia as you can get, quite honestly. But just one one person's opinion here. Yeah, I agree no, with you on that. Stockholm is amazing. You. Yeah, it really is. Beautiful city. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, let's uh, let's wrap this up and say once again, thank you so much, Robert, for sharing your story with yeah. us, for letting us pick your brain and hear about your journey and, and all the, the ups and downs of, of your trip that you've made so far. Uh, everybody that's listening, go to pole to pole flightcom check out the website, um, the cool videos that are there. Um, and uh, did you mention as well when the, when the book will be released? That's a good question. I would say uh, probably first part of the year uh, it'll come out. I've actually written uh, about 375 pages of it already wow. but you know i don't even know how it's going to finish up so we still have more to go yeah it's gonna yeah. be thick that's exciting yeah. then we have a cliffhanger right can't there wait. we'll be waiting wait. for it can't wait yeah, yeah. All right. absolutely okay all right guys thank you so much for what you're doing for aviation i appreciate it thank you God for bless. joining us fly, okay. fl fly safe fly yes. safe always blue skies always okay Hap happy landings pilot talk Available on iTunes, Spotify, or osmaviation.com slash podcast. Okay, that is a wrap for today's episode. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, don't forget to follow the Pilot Talk podcast on Instagram for behind-the-scenes material. There you can also send us your feedback, your ideas, uh, suggestions for guests, questions. And we're also going to have competitions from time to time where we give away free stuff. As always, you can find our podcast on Spotify, iTunes, and Podbean. And you can also tune in at osmaviation.com slash podcast. And uh, until next time, my friend. Blue sky, my buddy. And, and happy landings. You got it. There Take care. Go. See you later. Bye. Ciao.